Hi everyone, if you're new here, I'm Alan with Earth Glow, and this channel is all about sharing the joy of candle making. In today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you a sort of my process for doing one of my wholesale orders. And so you're gonna see me making these candles from start to finish uh, for one of my wholesale clients. So these candles are actually for the Deschamps Braley Clinic and they are located in San Francisco, and this is actually where I had one of my seven gender confirmation surgeries. So it's kind of special because these candles are given to transgender patients after they've had a uh, facial uh, gender confirmation surgery, and it's just something really special to me uh, to be able to do for this clinic. And I love all my wholesale customers. Um, I have a handful of wholesale clients, um, several spas and a couple of gift shops that um, I'm so grateful to have. And I look forward to continuing to expand um, my wholesale customers. Um, but anyways, let's get right into this video and I hope you enjoy. So usually the very first thing that I do is put on my gloves because when I'm using the Permatex as well as um, when I'm sealing my jars, it's just really helpful to wear gloves. And then these are just the little foam brushes um, that I use when I'm applying my EarthSafe Finishes Preserver slash Sealer. And so because of the fact that the fragrance that I use for these candles is a very high content of vanillin, um, it does cause some discoloration in my tins. So I do go through the trouble of sealing all of my candle tins. I don't actually seal the lids on these ones um, because I find that there's just not enough um, discoloration that it actually affects the lids but um, I do go ahead and apply this um, to the inside of my tins just so you can see there what that looks like and what I'll typically do is kind of work my way around in like a circular pattern and then I will um, usually let it dry for about 30 minutes before I add a second coat and I just try to get a really thin layer. You don't need very much. Um, so just a very small amount of this stuff and goes a long way. Like this jar that I have will probably end up lasting me like eight or 10 months, um, I would say. So this is what the final product looks like after the first coat and it does dry down really quick and then I'm just showing my little bag there so that um, I can reuse my brush. I just put it in one of those little bags. I'm just putting my gloves back on here and I do reuse these nitrile gloves um, that I get on Amazon um, usually because like just the glue on them. Um, I'll reuse them a few times for this type of a thing. And so I'm gonna just go ahead and do one more thin coat now that the other um, sealer has dried. And it is recommended to do two coats. Um, Nancy with EarthSafe Finishes, the manufacturer, or well, she's not the manufacturer, but she's the one who um, created the product and she does recommend that um, with 30 minutes apart. So I'm just going in, and this is really tedious. Um, like I would say it actually ended up taking an hour or two um, to do both coats, but it's so worth it because this will totally prevent that discoloration um, that typically happens when you have higher amounts of vanillin as well as sometimes it can happen with cinnamon or some types of citruses in your fragrance oil. So that is just adding that extra skin um, on the inside of your jar. This is after the second coat. You can hardly see um, that there's anything on there. It just looks nice and shiny and 
Oh, I'm so happy that I found this product because it has made my life so much easier with these tins. Okay, and now I'm going to be using the CD12 Wick series, um, and I do get these from Candle Science or Flaming Candle, um, just whoever I'm ordering from really, but I'm going to be using, um, actually I think before I get the Permatex I just usually put them in the containers, and it saves me a lot of time to not have to get each individual wick, so I just kind of throw one in each container and then I'll go back in once I'm finished with this, um, with my Permatex, and then actually start adhering um, the wicks to the bottoms of the tins. And I do eyeball this. I know a lot of people will use like the wick centering tools. Yep, there's my Permatex. They don't go anywhere with this. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I usually just eyeball it. Um, and I don't use any sort of centering tools. Sometimes there's like one or two that um, you know, just got a little bead of Permatex there. Just need a very small amount. But sometimes there's like one or two that will be so off-center that I just will pull them and not use them for um, my customer or my wholesale client, etc. But usually, I think you can get pretty good at just kind of eyeballing where the center um, of your container is. It's kind of therapeutic and meditative to do this when you're not in a rush. It's just kind of therapeutic. I'm just going to fast forward. And then right here, I'm just showing how you can actually take a little bit of Permatex and put it on one wick and then just stick it to another. And you can save yourself a little bit of time that way once you've figured out kind of how much Permatex you need. Uh, that's typically what I will do. And so you put that one bead on and then just stick it to another. And then sometimes if there's little spider webs, you can just sort of spin it around like that. And that will save you some time. Here I am just getting my scale ready and I'm going to be doing my beeswax, soy, and cocoa cream. Uh, it's a variation on my blend. So I'm going to be measuring out the soy wax and I do use 464, um, the Golden Brands 464 Soy. just has a great hot throw um, for soy waxes and then I'm going to be, looks like I'm going to fill up this whole bowl. So there's quite a bit of soy and I will put the recipe down below as well. But usually I'll do my soy in one container and then my beeswax and my cocoa cream in a separate container because I just find that I keep my bowl cleaner uh, for the soy wax when that's its own separate thing. And then because the coconut oil is really kind of messy and it's just, I would never want to work with like paraffin or even apricot cream, like, it's just a really messy wax. Um, but anyways, I do do that in a separate bowl. And I do use um, the Soper's Choice. So I'll have, um, actually, I have all my vendors that I purchase this recipe from um, in most all of my description boxes. And I'm just getting everything into my Presto pot. Now, I do usually use a DG boil for larger orders um, when I'm making a lot of candles. But for this particular wax blend, since I did just start using it in um, 2022 at the very beginning of the year, actually at the end of the year of 2021 is really when I first started using it. Um, I just feel like I have more control um, when I'm using this blend in the Presto pot just better control of my temperatures and so I'm going to be pouring this in and usually what I have to do is wait for all this to melt down before I can get everything in the pot because there's so much air when you just put the soy wax in especially 
So I let some melt down and then I will go ahead and add more. And then as that is melting, I will be usually measuring out my fragrance oil. So I'm gonna be using the Flaming Candles Cashmere Cedar and I do use the beakers to measure out all my fragrance oils because uh, I just find that having these designated containers is really helpful to me. Yep, so there's the cashmere cedar and I'm gonna be measuring out I think just over 10 ounces so it ends up being um, about 10% fragrance load for this recipe. And that's actually the amount that I use on almost all of my candles. Um, if a fragrance is particularly strong, I will use sometimes as low as 7%, but very rarely. Um, I would say for probably 90% of my candles, I use a 10% fragrance load. Um, but you always just want to check with your wax manufacturers for the right load. So I'm just stirring my melted wax here and I'm shooting the temperature with my infrared thermometer. And I usually do that to get like a generalized temperature, but you do need to always stir before you shoot your temperature with the infrared because it does just measure the surface temperature. And I'm just getting ready to pour in my fragrance oil. There it goes. So I always add that in at 185 when I'm using this wax blend, but I'll usually take the wax up to about 200 Sometimes I'll even add it in at like 195 when I'm using this particular oil because it has a lot of vanillin. Um, but yeah, I'll take the whole blend up to 200 and that just kind of tempers the wax, almost like making chocolate. Um, and so I will stir for a full two minutes. And I know with some waxes you can get away with stirring for less, but this one does have a great throw um, when you stir for two minutes. And so I do usually put this into the pouring pitcher at about 155, 160-ish. And then I'll usually pour this wax as cool as I possibly can because that will minimize um, the sinkholes that you can sometimes get. So if I pour at like 145, 140 to 145, I usually can totally avoid those, um, at least in the tins. And then just the spouts always like drip on the Presto Pots and the DG Boils. So I have a paper towel usually on hand. This is such a bad idea to do this over a wood floor um, as well. And I just have my little towel there and I'll try to just catch it right after I've got into the pouring pitcher. And this is one of my favorite parts of making candles. It's just always so magical because the whole room just smells like whatever fragrance you're working with oftentimes. Usually with these tins, so these are the ones I outsource on Alibaba, and usually I will have to do a little bit less than I think and come back and top them off but they don't have like a marker. If you purchase tins from Aztec or the Flaming Candle, they have like a nice marker where you can see where the top of the kind of tin is. But anyways, it's just kind of a process of going back and forth and then adding more wax to the Presto pot because there's like three full pots to make 50 candles. And so it usually takes a few hours and I could do this so much quicker if I just used my DG Voil, which is what I use for literally all my other candles that are made with 464. I'm just not quite comfortable yet with this new wax blend. Yep, and that is my stick thermometer, and I use that to get the most precise temperature readings. So I usually use the infrared thermometer to get my generalized readings and then the stick thermometer to get those really precise readings when I need that level of precision. And I think I am probably looking for the right temperature to add in my fragrance oil. And 
just getting ready to pour some more candles. Usually I will do several pouring pitchers before I put the wick clips on because this wax doesn't get, um, it doesn't start to set up super fast at all. So you usually have like a good, I would say like five, 10 minutes. And even longer, if you're just working with soy, it takes a really long time to harden. These are the wick clips that I use, and I think they're actually called wick bars. Um, I get them on Candle Science now. I used to get them on Amazon, but the ones on Amazon, the holes in the center where the wicks go were sometimes like obstructed, so they weren't working out very well. Um, but the ones from Candle Science, I will say they're not perfect by any means, but they are better than the ones I've gotten on Amazon. But anyways, I'll just kind of go and you can see the wicks still sometimes will pop out of them. I used to use the ones that are where you set them over the tin and they have like a little hole in the center. And I started on those, but I definitely find that these wick bars are just a little bit easier and they just are kind of more aesthetically pleasing to me. And I do also find that using a pattern where I'll go down one way and back the other way with the wick bars, it just makes it a little easier for them to not like knock each other and fall into the candle tins. But it's just a very potentially messy process. And I will say that I always keep like a spare pouring pitcher or at least some paper towels off to the side so that if I start spilling, I can just like, for example, like if a wick bar falls into a candle, I can just drop it in the pouring pitcher. Um, Cause once they fall in, they're kind of done. So I am just getting these ones done and then I'll have to go back and actually make one more pot. Um, Cause I don't have all the tins filled yet. So it's like three batches in the Presto pot to fill these 50 tins. And these are what the candles look like the next day. I usually let them harden overnight before I remove any of the wick bars or trim the wicks. Sometimes with 464 you can get frosting, but I found that when I add the beeswax and the cocoa cream to it that it totally avoids that generally. You get a nice creamy finish. So just removing all those wick bars and then I'm going to be using wick trimmers to trim the wicks on all of these down to about a quarter of an inch. Uh, I'd say maybe an eighth to a quarter of an inch because um, I like it to be a little bit longer for the first burn um, but an eighth of an inch is ideal. For subsequent burns um, and these wick trimmers that I use I actually get on Amazon and I will link them below they're just super sharp and then the next thing I'm gonna do is add on my labels so these are the labels and I do print these just on an inkjet printer but um, I actually seal them with a Krylon I believe it's the triple gloss because um, I like the finish that it has and then it also keeps the black ink from um, transferring. So I usually just press at the center and then work my way out with my fingers kind of really flat on there just to avoid bubbles. Sometimes you will still get bubbles and I'm sort of a fanatic. I will actually 
take off the label and just not use it if there's bubbles because it just drives me crazy. But I do all my own label design on Maestro through online labels and I purchase my blank labels from online labels as well. And I don't use Canva like most people I think do when they're doing their label design. Sort of old school I guess with using Maestro. I think most people import from Canva. I've had some friends who are like, Alan you need to start doing that. Um, but I've been generally happy with using the Maestro label design software so I've seen no need to switch at this point to Canva. And then I'm gonna just be going through all of these candles. It does take some time, but it's kind of therapeutic again. Like you want to do it when you're not in too much of a rush. And I'm just showing here how these label sheets, I do end up having to throw away the top three and the bottom three because they just start printing like, or you can see a little tiny bit of margin like it will not go quite black all the way. So I actually, yeah, and I'm even showing here. So this is one from the sides. I would highly not recommend getting these full page labels from online labels. I would recommend getting something where it doesn't go all the way to the edges because I end up having to hand trim a lot of my labels because it's not possible to center them on the pages where they're like the full, the full page all the way to the edges. Um, so when I go to repurchase after I finish all of these, I will not be, I will repurchase like the same size exactly if I can, but not the ones that go all the way to the edge of the page. And then I'm going to be adding the warning labels next. And these I do the exact same thing with where I print them on my inkjet, seal them myself, and then I just add them to the bottom of each candle. I can do another video as well on what the legal requirements are um, that you need to have on your warning label if you're selling candles in the United States, just to make sure that you're in compliance with the federal laws there and keeping everybody safe when they're using your products. The next thing that I'm going to be doing is adding these amethyst crystals. Most of my candles um, that are not made with wooden wicks, I do usually add crystals and golden lipidolite mica. It's kind of something that's special to me um, to do with my candles. And I'm just pressing in those amethyst pieces. And you can get these, um, I usually will get them at gem shows. Um, rocks and minerals are definitely something that I am really big into but if you don't go to gem shows I'm sure that there's places online that you can buy them affordably um, or maybe you can even outsource them on Alibaba um, I've actually done that a time or two and it can be a little bit unreliable with the sizing I found but you can definitely get some good prices on there on um, crystals if you like those for your candles. I do usually stick to silicates, so um, silicon dioxide based minerals, so amethyst is an example of that. Um, and then the other crystals that you'll see me adding to these, um, the golden rutile is another silicon dioxide based mineral. Um, and that just um, for me gives me a bit more peace of mind, um, like for example tiger's eye um, actually contains asbestos. So there's a lot of like sometimes poisonous things in crystals. So just for me personally, I like to stick to silicates on my candles because they do get, you know, fairly warm when the candle is lit. So just adding one or two pieces of amethyst to each of these. And the next thing I'm going to be doing is adding the golden rutile. And I usually do these after I've added the amethyst because the amethysts are kind of bigger and they're kind of like my little centerpiece. So I'm just going to go ahead and sprinkle some of these on each of my candles is usually how I start. And then I'm going to actually individually place them. So then what I'm going to do is kind of get them all to one side. And I usually like to use the piece of amethyst as like this kind of center stone. 
And then I'm gonna press them into the wax just kind of with my fingers and just kind of eyeball where I like. And once I finish this with all of them, I'm going to show you how I keep these in place and how I kind of finish off the look so that it looks more finished and not like I just pressed them in there. So what I actually use is this creme brulee torch and I just start going around the candle and you have to be really careful with this. Um, I'd recommend a heat gun if you're new because uh, it is easy to set the wick on fire and so you also just want to keep it on a low setting and I'll link the torch that I use in the description box as well but um, I would recommend just wearing goggles just in case any of the crystals do get too hot they can pop um, so you do need to just kind of be careful um, with getting too close to the crystals so a nice low setting and then just kind of going around and one of the biggest challenges is that the crystals can oftentimes fall into the center and I like to keep them more like at the sides of the container so I usually go around like twice and because I don't want to melt too much wax so that they slide so I'll like do my first round and then let it harden a little bit and then I'll come back around and do a second take on them and then I totally let the wax almost completely set up so I would say I wait like probably an hour or two before this next step So the final thing that I'm going to be doing is adding this golden lipidolite mica to the tops of my candles and I kind of hand grind it almost like um, I think of like hand ground pepper or something but I find that it kind of has a more irregular look to it than if I had gotten it pre-ground um, and again I usually get this um, when I'm doing my mineral shopping at gem shows etc but I have found this company called Rough Stone Minerals, I believe it's called. You can get this golden lipidolite um, mica from them as well. And I think it should come in full slab form where you kind of can hand grind it like this um, if you like the look. But mica is just such a beautiful touch. And it I do try to get it pretty ground up just so that way it doesn't catch fire. Um, if you get too big of pieces, they can burn. Um, mica will burn, unlike the crystals. So I just try to get really, really finely ground pieces. The very last thing that I'm going to be doing is adding these top labels and these I also just print the same way and I'm trying to show the little finish you can see on them that's just from the Krylon that I use it's just kind of dual purpose to seal them and also to add that kind of leather like texture so when I'm doing this I try to work from the inside and press outwards it's so easy to get bubbles in these top labels I cannot even begin to tell you, but I do find that getting the matte labels works better than getting the gloss labels. 